All right, welcome everybody to Team Trump Online. I'm Laura Trump, Senior Advisor to President Trump's re-election campaign. We are so excited tonight and we are honored to have a very special guest join us, Vice President of the United States, Mike Pence. Vice President Pence, thank you so much. This is so great. We're excited to get you on the show. Uh, great to have you here, Laura, and uh, welcome to the Vice President's residence. Thank you. It's beautiful. Honored to be here. and. Um, I want to start by talking about a story I don't think many people have heard, but to me this story is so representative of really the great relationship that I think you have with the president, with our families, uh, you know, it, it, it's so special. The story of when the president, then the candidate, Donald Trump flew into Indianapolis to meet with you, something happened to the plane and I think it really led to the fact that you became his running mate and then vice president of the United States. Can you share that story with our viewers? Well, it was it was uh, it was very special. You know, I hadn't I hadn't met your father in law more than a couple of times. Um, he had come by the governor's residence in Indiana. And um, um, but um, but on that visit, he had come down to Indiana for a rally. And I had the privilege of being able to introduce him at the rally. And then. We gathered for dinner downtown with Eric yeah. uh, and uh, with the president. And uh, we got word that their airplane had a flat tire and was not able to fly out that night. We were actually planning, Karen and I, very privately to fly back to New York because uh, to know your father-in-law is to know someone who's all about his family. Yeah. And before he made a decision, and I was, we were on the list with some other wonderful Americans, I knew he wanted us to meet the family, the family to meet us uh, before he made a final decision. But with, with the flat tire, he just immediately reversed plans. And the next morning, the family all flew out, um, uh, at least the kids did, yeah. and we hosted them for a breakfast at the governor's residence. And, uh, and when he left, he said, I'm gonna make a decision today, we'll call you either way tonight. And uh, uh, I'll never forget when we uh, we got the word that a phone call was going to come that night. Um, we'd, we'd already decided, we'd prayed all the way through it, we talked to our kids, we said, we said we're going to say yes without hesitation. I just, I just sensed what the American people have seen over the last three and a half years, that, that in this president there was a, a, someone with a vision, with the leadership qualities who could really bring this country all the way back. And so. When the phone rang, I was standing in the study at the governor's residence, and uh, I'll never forget, I picked up the phone about 10 o'clock at night, and he said, Mike, it's gonna be great. And then he said, we're gonna, we're gonna work, we're gonna campaign, we're gonna go across the country, we're gonna tell the story, we're gonna make this country great again. And I'll never forget, I said to him, well, you know, if there's a question in there, the answer is yes. And he said, oh, no. <laughs> By the way. He said, oh, yeah, no, of course, yes. And, uh, oh. and, and we went from there, and it's uh, just, really been uh, the greatest privilege of, of, of my and my family's life uh, to uh, be a part of this team and be a part of this administration to serve alongside this president. Well, I'll tell you that meeting, um, I really do think because there was the problem with the tire and it allowed everybody to stay in Indiana and for the family to fly in then to, to be at the governor's residence, I'll never forget hearing after everybody came back, oh my gosh, they're such wonderful people. We had the best time. But you probably know this, that is very rare for a tire to blow out on an airplane like that. In all the years that I've known uh, the president, I have never heard of that happening. So Mr. Vice President, for whatever that is, whether you're talking about somebody else, a, a bigger power looking out and looking over us, there was something to that. And I'll never forget that story. And I think it's very powerful and, mm -hmm. and really speaks to, to what this is all about and, and it's really about it's about a bigger presence it's about faith it's about god and i'd like you if you could maybe to touch on that as it relates to you as it relates to the president um you have both been tasked with um with a lot this year specifically has been very challenging for this country um over the past three and a half years you've both led us through through so many challenges and to so many triumphs but faith truly has played, I think, a very large role in that for you and for the president. Maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Well, I, I've, I've always believed that the three pillars of American greatness are faith and freedom and our vast natural resources. And uh, um, 
The president today signed uh, the Great American Outdoors Act, the largest investment in conservation since the presidency of Teddy Roosevelt. We know he's been a great champion for freedom, economic freedom, less taxes, less regulation, the kind of fair trade that puts American workers first. But I, I, I must tell you that the way this president has been a champion uh, for people of faith, for religious liberty in this yeah. country is deeply meaningful uh, to us as it is to millions of Americans. I'll actually be in Florida tomorrow for a Faith in America rally because it's an opportunity for us to go out and to talk about how this president has stood for the right to life. He's, he's stood um, for religious freedom. And, you know, I, I remember in, even in the midst of these very challenging times uh, of the coronavirus pandemic, when the president stood at that podium at the White House and said, as states were beginning the process of, of safely beginning to reopen businesses and, and put economies back to work, um, he said, we have to open up our churches. We have to open up our synagogues. Yeah. We have to open up our places of worship. And, and, and he's a president who uh, comes out of that experience himself, um, but also he, he deeply uh, cherishes and understands the importance of faith to the American people. And um, uh, it's, it's been a very special part of, of, uh, of uh, uh, our time of service to, to be a part of that mission. Yeah, I, I wanna change gears for just a moment. We are in the midst of uh, a campaign season. I, I, it feels very different, I think, for a lot of people. But uh, you have really dedicated your life to public service and in mm -hmm. and, and so many different ways. You've had the opportunity. You just did uh, a big event with police officers. And right. we know how important our, our law enforcement officers are in this country. I mean, they are the reason that we keep this country, the America that it is, and they keep us safe and our community safe, et cetera. Um, to you, the fact that we have a legitimate candidate for president of the United States who has talked about defunding our police, um, what does that say to you? What, what is at stake right now as we head towards November 3rd? And, and what do you want people to know about that? I think it's a very important issue and I think it's something that, that really we need to make clear to people. If you defund the police, we lose our communities, we lose our states, we lose our country, yet we do have someone running for president of the United States and Joe Biden that has said he would like to redirect funding, also known as defund the police. Right, well, Laura, I really believe the stakes in this election have never been higher and the choice has never been clear, whether it's, whether it's uh, all that the president did to revive this economy in the first three years through less taxes, less regulations, all the things that we talked about before, free and fair trade unleashing American energy. But to your point, security is the foundation of our prosperity. I mean, we have to have law and order in our streets to, to allow our families to be safe, our businesses to prosper, our communities to thrive for everyone of every race and creed and color. And that's why it's so troubling uh, to see Joe Biden and the Democratic Party overtaken by the agenda of the radical left uh, that, that has been talking about everything from dismantling police departments, as the city council voted to do in, in Minneapolis, yeah. uh, or, uh, or as, as Joe Biden himself said, he was, a, he was asked on the subject of defunding the police, would he be willing to redirect funds from law enforcement? And he said, yes. Absolutely. Well, what, what I said at the Cops for Trump rally in Pennsylvania last week, what President Trump has said over and over again, is we're not going to defund the police. Not now, not ever. No. What, what we're actually going to do is we're going to fund law enforcement with more resources. This president supported the cops program to allow the hiring of 4,000 police officers. Um, we, we, have, uh, uh, we, we have supported uh, the, the kinds of reforms, criminal justice reform that, that, that continue to drive us toward a more perfect union. And, and the president, in, in the wake of the, the tragedy in Minneapolis of George Floyd, and uh, there, there's no excuse for what happened to George Floyd, and justice will be served. Absolutely. Where the radical left said, we need to blame the police first. We need to, we need to, to, to defund the police. But what this president said is no. 
What we're going to do is we're going to fund law enforcement with more resources to improve public safety, to improve training in use of force and de-escalation. We're, we're going to Im improve and make more resources available for accountability. You know, my uncle was a police officer in Chicago for 25 years. And what this president understands and this vice president understands is that that nobody hates bad cops more than good cops. That's right. And that the men and women who serve in law enforcement every day, with very few exceptions, are the best people in this country. And so we're going to back the blue. We're going to give them the support that they need. And we're also going to reject the false choice that, that Joe Biden and the Democrats seem to be presenting to the American people, that we've got to make a choice between supporting law enforcement or supporting our minority communities in our major cities. We, we, we don't have to make that choice. What this president has done over the last three and a half years, and he's going to do for the next four years, is we've done both. We're going to continue to do both. We're going to continue to back the blue, support law enforcement without apology, with, with more resources to, for, to improve public safety, and we're going to continue to fight for opportunities for African American neighbors, for um, for Hispanic American neighbors, for, for every American living in our cities. Um, it, 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 what, I, I couldn't be more proud to be part of an administration, Laura, that before this pandemic struck, we had the lowest unemployment ever recorded for African Americans. Right. We created with Senator Tim Scott, we created more than 8,000 opportunity zones that were attracting billions of dollars of investment, creating jobs in our inner cities. This president has championed school choice for inner city families. He, it was one of the first conversations he and I had back when he was considering me for this position because Indiana had, we had one of the largest school choice programs in the country. Wow. And he immediately talked to me about his passion mm -hmm. for letting parents choose where their kids go to school. Now, those are those are issues about improving education, improving jobs, Im improving public safety in our cities. And that's the agenda we're going to continue to advance at the same time of supporting law enforcement. But we're, we're not going to uh, we're not going to uh, allow this country to go down the path of the radical left that presents that false choice. We're going to support law enforcement, support our minority communities and make this country stronger and more prosperous for every American. Yeah, you're right. You don't have to choose one or the other. It's a great point. My cousin happens to be in law enforcement in mm -hmm. Alabama. And look, all I know is that these are people that leave their homes in the morning, leave their families in the morning. They don't know if they're going to come back at the end of the day, but they're willing to risk their lives to keep us all safe, to give us all the opportunities that we're afforded in this country to make sure that every American has their freedoms and they stay intact. Uh, so we're very appreciative of every, our law enforcement officers. Laura, every day a, a man or woman puts on the uniform of law enforcement, straps on a sidearm, puts the badge on their shirt, walks out the door. They have decided to count our lives more important than their own. That's true. And that's no greater love. Yeah. I mean, people are people go into law enforcement because they they love their families, they love their communities, they love their state, they love this nation, and uh, and I think they know they have a president who understands that, yeah. and 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 knows we're going to back the blue, we're going to stand with law enforcement, and at the same time, we're going to keep delivering on the promise uh, of opportunities and educational improvements and more jobs for for all of Americans, especially those in our minority communities. So I want to switch uh, for a moment and talk about coronavirus. Obviously, uh, the president appointed you the head of the coronavirus task force. Um, I think all of America has been very impressed with, with what you have done. I mean, it has not been an easy task. We have never found ourselves in modern history in a situation like this. But if you could talk about really the historic response by this administration, um, and I think thanks to this president and his vision for deregulation, for cutting through red tape, we are able now to possibly look at a vaccine. Uh, you know, Operation Warp Speed, these are things like this could not have been possible, I think, under another administration. But maybe you can talk about the response, the vaccine, and, and how all that's going. Well, I, th I think it's important to start at the beginning. 
I mean, and I also think it's important to remember the context. I mean, when Democrats in Washington, D.C. were preoccupied with efforts to impeach the president of the United States, right. a team came into the Oval Office and said to the president, there was virus coming out of China. And the president made the decision before we had one case of community transmission in America to suspend all travel from China. No president in the history of this country had ever done that, let alone with the second largest economy in the world. But I was sitting right next to the Resolute desk in the Oval Office when he did it. And he didn't hesitate to put the health of America first. The same day he stood up the White House Coronavirus Task Force. A, a week or two later, when we received the first genetic coding of the coronavirus, um, the NIH actually began work then on a vaccine. Literally, before the middle of February, we began, it would be 62 days later, in record time that we actually began the first clinical trial on a vaccine, utterly unheard of. You saw the president take action to suspend travel from other parts of the world, Europe, the UK, and, and the like. But when he tapped me to lead the coronavirus task force uh, in late February, there were less than 20 cases, domestic cases, of the coronavirus, where person-to-person -person transmission. And, and we'd done less than 8,000 coronavirus tests. But the president apprehended from the beginning that the old testing model of, of CDC laboratory or state laboratories wasn't going to work. So again, this businessman turned president reinvented testing. And literally, as we're sitting here today, we've done nearly 60 million tests from a standing start. We're doing 800,000 tests a day all across this country wow. uh, and, and scaling it and improving it every single day. You remember early in the pandemic, there was concern about ventilators and right. personal protective equipment. We call it PPE. And again, the president didn't just marshal the full resources of the federal government. He marshaled the full resources of the American economy. We partnered with General Motors and Ford and GE Healthcare, and they repurposed factory lines to manufacture ventilators that they had never manufactured before. And within just a few short weeks from right now, we'll have more than 100,000 ventilators in the strategic national stockpile. Okay. And no American who has required a ventilator has ever gone without a ventilator in the United States. That's an extraordinary national accomplishment. We scaled and saw the creation of and the delivery of hundreds of millions of personal protective equipment to our incredible healthcare workers. And in the midst of all of that, as you were saying, the president also called on the pharmaceutical industry in this country and said, I need medicines known as therapeutics. We've, we've got to get medicines to the American people in record time. And, and we, we drove toward the achievement of a vaccine. And one week ago, uh, the president was in your beloved North Carolina, That's and right. I was in Florida, on the first day of phase three clinical trials of what could be the first coronavirus vaccine in the United States. Now, Laura, I, I didn't know much about vaccines before they tapped me to lead this role, but I've learned a lot from our scientists and our doctors. The pace at which this president not only reinvented testing, flowed resources to states at the point of the need, um, but also advanced the process of developing medicines and vaccines is utterly unheard of. It usually literally takes years to create a vaccine. That's right. But what the president said, again, and sometimes we call this not just moving at warp speed, but moving at Trump speed. <laughs> the president said, without compromising safety or effectiveness right. one bit, let's collapse the process. Instead of waiting till we're the, at the very end of the phase three clinical trials to start making a vaccine, the president approved Operation Warp Speed, worked with Congress to secure billions of dollars. We're actually manufacturing prospective vaccines right now so that the moment the FDA determines that we have a vaccine that is safe and effective, we'll have tens of millions of doses for the American people. Fantastic. All of that said, I, I, and I know the president's heart is as heavy as all of ours for the more than 150,000 Americans who've lost their lives. Some his friends. And friends of his. Every, every one of our families yeah. and our communities have been touched by this. And anyone that's looking on, I, I just want you to know that 
There's not a day gone by that all of us working on the White House Coronavirus Task Force haven't thought of those who have lost loved ones. But I know in my heart of hearts that because this president took the action that he took to provide those supplies, because he called on the American people for those 45 days to slow the spread, because we've given the kind of guidance and we continue to supply support for areas of the country like the Sun Belt, that while they're improving, they're still dealing with, with outbreaks. Um, I, I know that we've saved tens of thousands of lives across this country. It's a, it's a tribute to our healthcare workers. It's a tribute to the cooperation of the American people. But I know that it's also a tribute to that whole of America approach that President Trump marshaled to deal with this coronavirus pandemic. So as we, we sit here, we are uh, less than 100 days from, uh, from an election. And I think, Mr. Vice President, Every four years you hear this is the most important election, this is the most important election. It couldn't be more apparent now that this truly is an election. I think that could alter our country possibly from the America we've always known if, if the wrong person gets elected into office. Um, if you have a message to deliver to the American people uh, about why it's so important that they get registered to vote, that they either request an absentee ballot if they can't or don't feel safe going to the polls, or that they go vote on November 3rd for, for President Donald Trump. What is your message to them right now? Laura, this isn't just the most important election of our lifetime. I think it's one of the most important elections in the life of this nation. Because on November 3rd, we won't decide whether America is going to be more Republican or more Democrat, more liberal or more conservative. In a very real sense, we're going to decide whether America is going to still be America. Whether we're going to chart a course in the future based on our commitment to a strong national defense, based on free enterprise and free market principles and allowing the American people to keep more of what they are, <clears throat> getting big government off people's backs fighting for workers for free and fair trade, leveling the playing field, allowing the American people to develop all of the resources of this land, unleashing American energy, whether we're going to have a court system like the 200 judges this president has seen confirmed that believe that we should interpret the Constitution as written, that we should we should protect and preserve all the God given liberties enshrined in our Constitution or whether whether we're going to pivot to the radical left, which is which is the course that Joe Biden and and Bernie Sanders uh, and AOC plus three have all charted in the Democratic Party, and, and I, I must tell you, it, you know, you wouldn't know this about me, but when I was a teenager, um, I was active in the Democratic Party in my hometown in Indiana. Oh wow! It was after I I heard the voice of my second favorite president, Ronald Reagan, that I realized my home was in the Republican Party. And in a very real sense, uh, I, I never thought I'd see the day when, when the Republican Party would become home to what used to be timeless ideals. It used to be we all believed in a strong national defense. But you compare that to the, the Obama-Biden record on national defense. When we took office, and, and I say this as the father of a Marine aviator and the father-in-law of a naval aviator, People deserve to know when we took office, we were told that the Air Force had a large percentage of their aircraft on the ground being used as spare parts to keep other aircraft in the air. This president's made the largest investments in our national defense in American history. We've rebuilt our military. We've restored the arsenal of democracy. We're standing tall in the world again. We're respected again. But it was the Democratic Party that supported reckless cuts uh, in our national defense. When it, when it comes to economic growth, the president's record is clear, but Joe Biden, as our nation is now recovering from the worst pandemic in a hundred years, and we are recovering. At, at the height of the pandemic, Laura, we'd lost 22 million jobs, but because of that foundation that President Trump poured, a free market, free enterprise, less taxes, less regulation, We've actually already added 7 million jobs back and the economy is coming back. Joe Biden and the radical left, they want to raise taxes by $4 trillion in the midst of a, 
of a pandemic in a recovering America. When it comes to American energy, where President Trump has, has, has embraced an all of the above energy strategy, we're now a net exporter of energy for the first time in 75 years in this country, well on our way to energy independence. Joe Biden has a $2 trillion version of the Green New Deal that would crush American energy, end fracking, I mean, it literally take our country a decade back and more uh, on the path we've been on for energy independence. And then when you look at the courts uh, with, the, with the conservatives that the president has appointed and will continue to appoint for four more years, contrast that with the judicial activism of the left um, that, 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 that believe in legislating from the bench, that believe that what they can't accomplish in the ballot box, they can accomplish right. in the courts. And you see that uh, the choice in this election could not be clearer. And I, I, just, I just encourage everyone that takes time for Team Trump online to, to recognize that, that even in these challenging times, all of us need to do our part. I spoke in Ripon, Wisconsin, not long ago. It was the city where the Republican Party was born in the days following or preceding the Civil War. And, and I, said, I said then, we're going through a time of testing, but soon we will come to a time for choosing. And as each one of us helps our families, helps our communities, helps our businesses, helps the vulnerable see our way through this challenging time in this pandemic, I think we do well. Uh, to remember this is also time for choosing and to take the opportunity to volunteer, not just get registered to vote, but get involved. Yeah. Find some time to call neighbors and friends, be, participate. I, I, I will tell you, as I've traveled around the country, particularly over the last couple of months, Laura, I'm convinced that the enthusiasm today around America for this president, for his vision for America is greater than it was I agree. four years ago yep. when he came to the governor's residence in Indiana and invited us to join this team. But it's going to take all of us to do it. So I just I just encourage people to uh, let your voice be heard. Become involved. Tell the story of what this president did in the first three years, how we made America great again, and how this president's leadership has seen us through one of the most challenging times at home in the last 100 years with this pandemic. Um, and tell your neighbors and friends that this president, his vision uh, for a strong America, a prosperous America, America grounded in our highest ideals, made America great again before, and it's going to make America great again, again. Absolutely. Love it, love it. Well, Mr. Vice President, thank you so much. It's been a true honor and such a treat to be here in your home and to, to get a, a chance to talk with you. I know that our audience is so excited to hear from you. And I uh, just wanna say thank you. Thank you for fighting for this country, for this president. Um, you really give people hope and inspiration. And now is a time I think we need it more than ever. Uh, so thanks for all you do and thanks for sitting down with us tonight. Laura, great to be with you. And, and I wanna say thanks to all the, the viewers, all the support and you know the, the sweetest words the president and I ever hear. Wow. And we hear it a lot when people say, I'm praying for you. Yep. And uh, I just want to say to all the people looking on, uh, I know the president feels those prayers every day. We feel those prayers every day. And I'm, I'm absolutely convinced um, with support of the American people in the days ahead, we're going to reelect this president for four more years. We're going to renew Republican leadership all across this country. And the best is yet to come to that. All right. Well, thank you again to Vice President Mike Pence and thanks to all of you at home for watching tonight. We'll see you next time on Team Trump Online.